Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Finneran's Wake. I am with unwavering commitment to the cause of great conversation, your faithful friend and humble host, Daniel Finneran. Thank you so very much for joining me this evening. Upon reflecting on a week of extraordinary conversations with Dan Willingham of the University of Virginia, Glenn Elmers of the Claremont Institute, and Svetlana Slapshik, a uh, classicist, anthropologist, philologist from Slovenia. I realized that there was a book to which I repeatedly made reference. That book is Milan Kundra's 1984 work, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Now, I was introduced to Kundra by a previous guest, Noah Charney, with whom I had a delightful conversation a few weeks ago on art, art history, art thievery, and aesthetics. At that time, he re recommended that I read one of Kundra's lesser known works called Slowness, um, that I do plan to pick up and read in the future. But as a way to introduce myself to Kundra's oeuvre, uh, I first went to that which is known best, and that is The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Now, I should tell you, this book had a profound impact on me. Before I describe exactly why and in what ways it did, I want to tell you a little bit about Kundra. He's an extraordinary figure, much like those guests uh, uh, of whom I just made mention. Kundra was born in what is now Czechoslovakia in the year 1929, just prior to the Second World War. Now, of course, Czechoslovakia was conquered, was overwhelmed, was taken by the Nazi war machine during his own lifetime. So he lived in a turbulent era. And I should say that he's still alive to this day, to this day at the age of 94. Uh, he understandably became a sympathizer with the Communist Party in the post-war years due to the uh, ravages to which he was subjected by the Nazi party and the disgrace visited upon his country by that regime. But he had the impulse of a reformer. He was a communist, but a reformer, and for that reason was twice expelled from the party to which he at once <laughs> pledged his allegiance and from which he was eventually dispelled. In time, he found refuge in the country of France, to which he fled in the early 1970s after the Prague Spring. Now, the Prague Spring was a pivotal moment in the national history of Europe, uh, generally, but specifically of Czechoslovakia, or the Czech Republic. Uh, just in brief, uh, after a few decades of Soviet rule, the uh, Czech people sought reform. They wanted a human face to be put on what was the a hard uh, visage of communism. And to that end, they elected a new representative and uh, brought forth new ideas that they thought could uh, soften what was a hard and illiberal regime. And for a while, there seemed to be some success Beginning in the winter of 1968, they attempted through democratic means to institute some changes and to become more liberalized. Uh, but this reformation process and period was short-lived. In the late summer of 1968, the Prague Spring, as it came later to be known, was squashed by uh, the Soviets, by the USSR in what became known as the Warsaw Pact invasion. Uh, the USSR, with the assistance of four other Warsaw Pact nations, invaded and occupied Czechoslovakia and submitted it to its suzentry, to rather mm, unfriendly rule. And Czechoslovakia remained under the rule of the USSR until its dissolution 
in 1989, or thereabouts. At that time, the Velvet Revolution came to pass, and that was a gentle or nonviolent revolution that saw the changing of the guard, so to speak, the transition from the communist government overseen by uh, the Kremlin in Moscow to a more self-determined nationalistic government overseen by Czechoslovakia. So this was the background against which Kundra based his novel, his most famous novel, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. I first referenced it in my conversation with Glenn Elmers, the esteemed political scientist and philosopher with whom I had a great conversation about everything uh, from Nietzsche to Aristotle to Plato to being red and black-pilled in the current age. In my conversation with him, I referenced Kundra's analysis of communism, of Marxism, and of what he called the Grand March. The Grand March, he says, is that is that process in which utopian leftists and Marxists uh, partake. It is the movement towards some grand end. And I think it would perhaps be more enlightening uh, for me to quote a short passage from Kundra's work, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, in which he describes the Grand March, about which Glenn and I spoke. The Grand March, Kundra says, is the splendid march on the road to brotherhood, equality, justice, happiness. It goes on and on, obstacles notwithstanding. For obstacles there must be if the march is to be the Grand March. The dictatorship of the proletariat or democracy? Rejection of the consumer society or demands for increased productivity? The guillotine or an end to the death penalty? It is all beside the point. What makes a leftist a leftist is not this or that theory but his ability to integrate any theory into the kitsch called the Grand March. Now, mind you, this isn't uh, a traditional right-winger criticizing leftism. Quite the contrary, this is a man of the left criticizing what he sees that has gone awry among his fellow travelers. It's not unlike a certain Englishman who was just a little bit before his time, but their lives did overlap, George Orwell, who as a left winger himself was socialism's uh, most incisive and unrelenting critic. I find that passage remarkable and resonant to the present day. The Grand March, it is the splendid march on which so many people in our society, progressives are uh, committed, to which they are committed and in which they are engaged. And sometimes it's difficult to tell exactly what the theory is that unifies them all. Well, in fact, there might not be a logically coherent and consistent theory. We think about, for instance, Progressive causes ranging from um, Palestine to transgenderism to feminism to, you know, an abolition of borders and other things such as that. On the surface, these things might not seem connected in any discernible way, and perhaps they aren't. And yet, that's not fundamentally essential. What is essential is that these theories are integrated into, as Kundra calls it, the kitsch of the Grand March. And by kitsch, he just means 
the aesthetic of a politician. It's something cheap, tawdry. It's when you raise a babe to your breast and hug it and kiss it just for the cameras. That's kitsch in his opinion. And he goes on to describe something even more daunting and ominous, which is totalitarian kitsch, which is basically the, the kitsch of one ruling class, such as we see it today. Uh, the totalitarian kitsch is going to be on full display in the coming days with the advent of June and Pride Month. Now, this is no judgment being cast on Pride Month or on the LGB community and the T community, uh, between which, as I understand it, there is some hostility. But it is something of totalitarian kitsch where all of academia and all of corporate America and all of the mainstream media and all of our politicians as they occupy the executive branch at present will be pushing forward a certain idea and that idea is consolidated. It's the single party voice and that is totalitarian kitsch. It's the aesthetic of a single dominant political party and idea. And we will witness that on full display come this June. So I thought that was worth mentioning, the grand march um, that Kundra speaks about in his masterful work. Uh, in my conversation with Svetlana, Kundra came to mind again in a less significant way. She mentioned that her namesake is actually Svetlana Stalin, the only daughter of Joseph Stalin, the dictator of the USSR, a quite murderous individual. Uh, Svetlana naturally wanted to distance herself from her uh, um, flagitious father. She did so by moving away to the West in the, I believe the late 1960s or 70s and beginning her life anew. Uh, by a strange course of events, Svetlana was named after Stalin's daughter. And uh, this brought me to Kundra because in Kundra's work, he talks about Stalin's son, Yakov. Uh, again, a name forgotten by history, but somewhat significant in that he was sent to a German labor camp along with British prisoners where he attempted to escape by jumping onto the electrified fence uh, in whose barbed wire he perished, not surprisingly. And Kundra talks about the strangeness of his existence, sort of this demigod type um, figure, such as he was the son of a god, the son of Stalin, who was revered as a god in some circles in that time, and also the, um, a son exiled or excommunicated from, from the family. And so that was my connection drawn between Svetlana and Yaakov, between Stalin and my conversation with uh, my esteemed guest and interlocutor, Svetlana. Kundra's book, I think, is uh, particularly important to me because it also deals with one of the most troubling ideas in philosophy, and that is the idea of immortality. Friedrich Nietzsche, in his uh, gay science talks about the, uh, the doctrine of eternal recurrence. Uh, if you will permit me, dear listener and friend, I want to read from you a passage from the gay science. And this is written just before Zarathustra, the main character, lighted upon the village square. Nietzsche asked the reader to imagine the following arresting scenario. What if some day or night a demon were to steal after you in your loneliest loneliness and say to you, 
this life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more. And there will be nothing new in it, but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh must return to you, all in the same succession and sequence. The eternal hourglass of existence is turned over again and again, and you, with it, speck of dust. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him? You are a god, and never have I heard anything more divine. If this thought were to gain possession of you, it would change you as you are, or perhaps crush you. The question in each and everything, do you want this once more, and innumerable times more, would lie upon your actions as the greatest weight. That, in Nietzsche's inimitably poetic form, is the doctrine of eternal recurrence or the eternal return. And that is the doctrine with which Kundra decides to open up his fantastic novel. <sighs> Kundra posits the opposite, the alternative. He posits a world in which there is no eternal recurrence, simply one moment lived and never lived again. And if that is the case, if each moment is a single event, never to be succeeded by one similar or repeated again, it loses much of its significance, does it not? it becomes light. Indeed, it becomes unbearably light. And that is precisely the language that Kundra uses to describe this type of existence, this meaningless existence. Each event that you live comes and goes. The present moment is fugacious, it lasts only as long as the present lasts, which, as we know, lasts not very long at all, and then it's gone. How can you capture that lightness? You really can't. And that's the idea with which Kundra grapples throughout the course of the novel. The four main characters all live existences that are all, for uh, lack of a better word, quite light. But you can see in Nietzsche's passage that an existence such as this, that perhaps could be repeated over and over again in perpetuity, ad infinitum, could either bring you to an enraptured state or it could bring you to a despairing one. If you truly, thoroughly, and sincerely enjoy your life, if you do things that make you happy, if you pursue noble ends, if you achieve high goals, if you live a purposeful life and a fulfilling one, to be able to live this over and again is a great blessing indeed. If, on the contrary, you live a humdrum existence that is debased, debauched, unfulfilling, dissatisfying, and 
empty, then to have to repeat this time and again, ad infinitum, is the worst possible nightmare by which you could ever be visited. Hmm. So in this way, we have to take Nietzsche's idea very seriously. We know not if we will enter into a history of eternal recurrence, into a future of eternal recurrence. But we have to imagine ourselves if we did. If upon entering that realm, we had to continue the world as we live it now, carry on the actions that we carry on with now, what would we do? How would we change? How would we interact with the world? And in his posthumous work, The Will to Power, Nietzsche confessed his doctrine of eternal recurrence to be the most extreme form of nihilism. This is somewhat surprising, given the options between rapture and despair that are presented to us when we consider the doctrine of eternal recurrence. Duration, Nietzsche explained, without aim and end, is the most paralyzing thought. Let us think this thought in its most terrible form. Existence as it is, without sense and aim, but recurring inevitably without a finale of nothingness, the eternal recurrence. So it's a heavy theme that Kundra adeptly and adroitly integrates into his book. I don't want you for that reason to think that it is too heady to be enjoyed. Kundra's work uh, builds itself from the foundation of Nietzsche's doctrine of eternal recurrence, but it treats it in a unique way. And in the course of the work, there are many other interesting things that happen. Thomas, the, the physician, the neurosurgeon, and the political dissident, has a strange approach to sex and love, um, about which you'll want to read more. He dissociates the two. He pursues sex as a way to probe into the um, unreachable aspects of womankind to learn their idiosyncratic eyes and to delve deeper into their psyches than can ever be done um, with a, a mere conversation or even a probing of the brain as he does in his work as a medical practitioner. And then love, uh, which is the exclusive feeling sentiment that one has for a beloved. He writes an essay comparing the communists uh, during the time of the Prague Spring with Oedipus, and basically condemns them to culpability for their actions. And just as Oedipus uh, undergoes self-flagellation for having um, committed the crime of incest and for having committed the crime of parricide, the communists should also repent, though they might not be fully culpable for their crimes. There are other characters like Sabina, Teresa, Franz, and Karinin, his dog, with whom you'll want to spend some time. So again, the philosophy in this book is heavy, but bearable. And the way in which it's written is wonderful. Um, Kundra's style, where he digresses into political, philosophical, and social themes is always stimulating and diverse. And also his occasional use of the first person when he talks directly to you as the reader. So I thought in closing that this book, Milan Kundra's The Unbearable Lightness of Being, is one with which you'll most certainly want to spend some time Again, it's one to which I've made repeated reference in the past couple of weeks, as it has occupied my mind. It's 
one of these books um, about which I'll be contemplating for quite some time. And it has uh, deserved and will forever occupy a, an important place on my bookshelf. So with that, I thank you, dear friends and listeners, for listening to this brief little exposition of Kundra and my recommendation to you that you should pick it up and read it. Until next time, dear friends, I fare thee well from Finneran's Wake.